Welcome to this event that has been curated by the BFI Film Academy Young Programmer, Billy Collins. Um, welcome to Queer and Pleasant Land. I just want to introduce our panelists tonight. Rupert Williams, producer of Landline, an award-winning short documentary about gay farmers' helplines. Emma Plover, a visual artist who produced Rewilding, a short video essay about being queer in a rural environment. And Michelle Laverick, Chair of Worksworth and District LGBTQI Plus Group. Michelle organises queer film nights at the Northern Light Cinema in rural Derbyshire. So to kick things off, I just want to ask, what is it like being LGBTQIA plus in a rural setting, in a rural community? Um, <laughs> Rupert, Rupert, you go there. <laughs> I'm cheating because I left. You know. <laughs> um, you know, he says, you know, in his like North London home. Um, so um, I don't know, because I think there's just different levels to that kind of rural community and those rural spaces and kind of like what that means. So it's like, I you know, I had quite, a, I don't know, an experience, a unique experience, like growing up in like a farming family, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like, I just always knew I was going to leave, you know? It was an option to stay, but I, don't think I could have stayed in the being who I was, you know, that just doesn't necessarily just relate to sexuality. So I think for me, it was quite difficult. It was quite tricky. I didn't kind of realize it was an option, you know, and I don't know, I sort of didn't see my story told. So it's quite difficult. And I thought it was also difficult being a man who was a farmer as well, because I didn't see there's like an emotional vocabulary for a lot of men. And so you tie that over. I mean, I, I suppose I'm, I'm bisexual, you know, so in some ways there's like, when I'm with women, you know, and it's a very different situation to how I'm, I'm with men when I'm in like rural spaces, you know, in terms of like dating and relationships and stuff. Yeah, so I kind of thought it would be easier in a city, you know, um, and I think that was probably an assumption, you know, but an assumption that I don't think was too far off. But also I think maybe there's a different sort of community that exists in kind of rural spaces that's kind of queer or LGBT, it's there, it's kind of present and I don't know, just something, sorry, as I tell you, I'll, I'll try and wrap up soon, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but I, when I made Landline, I found, a, a, the reason I, I think I made Landline, or was involved in making Landline, or had this gem of the idea was because I sort of needed to, you, you move from those spaces, but I really held on to that farming family, that farming identity in some way, you know. Like it's quite a strong culture, and I ended up speaking to someone who's like eight years old in rural Cumbria, who like worked on Cumbria's like gay phone line in like the nineteen sixties and seventies. He was like a farmer, but that person was in the village next door to my. They grew, they were from the village next door to where my mum was from. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. Made me. I didn't realize. I would. I, just, I would have loved to have known that when I was younger that like gay people existed and couldn't say gay queer. You know existed you know so yeah for me it was tricky didn't it? But, yeah. i was going to say just on what you said there is that it can also work in the opposite direction which is i'm a town rat who ended up living in the country mm -hmm. um and i came out in mm -hmm. a rural location as opposed to being in a metropolitan mm -hmm. area admittedly it's decades later i only came out three or four years ago I wonder whether it, what it's really about is, can you come out in the place that you were born, mm -hmm. whether that's in a large town or a city or a rural location where everybody knows you and has maybe preconceived ideas of who you are. So when you come out, what that does is sort of send psychic ripples across your, mm -hmm. all those local connections. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you come to a place where you don't have that, like my family don't live here, uh it's like a blank canvas uh where you get to define who you are based on the fact that, that here i am in this new place a relatively new person to wherever where it have a wherever it happens to be where you're living mm -hmm. and what about you emma that was quite interesting what you said about um like psychic ripples and like people sort of not knowing you or having any preconceived ideas because like i <laughs> i gave being in a city a go as well and uh, I, I actually went to London first and I, I didn't get on with it at all. And, um, <laughs> and then I, I came back home and then went to Manchester to go to uni. 
and um, I had a great time in in Manchester. Like I kind of came out before I went to London or Manchester. Manchester, but um, then I I actually moved back um, after I graduated because I was just sort of in that situation where I didn't think I could work enough in Manchester to to live um, and do art. And I sort of I came home. And it was a really big decision because like I had this huge history of like, well, not a huge history, but like um, my whole sort of like past history of like being in this place. And I, I had to come home and like find myself in this space and like find, find what this space meant to me. There's two narratives here, isn't there? I, I remember back in the 80s when the communard Small Town Boy came out. Yeah. It was such that dominant narrative that if you wanted to be who you wanted to be, you had to leave your small town mm. and you had to go to the city. Mm. And then there's that other uh, uh, popular narrative of being the only gay in the village <laughs> from Little Britain. And um, that is, that, that's funny because some people do choose to uh, make it the complete focus of their whole identity, their sexuality or their gender ID, or for some people it's just an aspect of who they are amongst all the other things that you you do but there's that those two very popular cultural references about having to leave or having to be the standard bearer of being the only gay in the village and all that kind of stuff which is obviously a bit tongue-in-cheek but also there's like a lot of cliches there's probably an element of truth to it it wouldn't be a cliche if there wasn't it can feel very very like real sometimes to be like the only girl in the village <laughs> i'm pretty sure i'm not but like <laughs> it does feel like it sometimes. I've got a good example of that an anecdote about two, two years ago i um put together a, a a float for our local carnival and it was the first pride float that they ever had and <laughs> of course my complete fear was that no one would show up on the day and it would just be me on the float <laughs> Unfortunately, lots of people did turn up, so I didn't feel completely like the only person in the village. But I think whenever you do anything like that, where you're organising it and you're relying on other people that show up, mm. part of you is like, oh, I hope other people will be there and it won't be just me on my own. But I think you could probably have that experience in a town or in a city or in, in, mm. in a small village that if you're sticking your neck out and being more visible, what if it is just you that's there and no one steps up to be alongside you, you know? Will they throw rotten apples at you and, and, and stuff like that? Is that, is that is something about that, kind of what you both said about like, that idea of like moving away? And like it takes the idea of like moving away and often I think like some of the things that go with rural spaces, like the idea of like anonymity and like not being seen and probably why I came to London and kind of like why I stayed in London. I remember kind of when I made it from you meet these farmers and thinking, oh, may may maybe I could, maybe I could marry a farmer. I'm like, you know, then it'd be all, it'd be all, it'd be all brilliant. <laughs> but then, so it's like a lot of the farmers that we met, we were mainly like white, we're white, all, all white men, you know. And so it's kind of, it's, it's strange when you're like going to these like farming homes, but like, of like some same sex couples and things like that. And it's like weird how these guys remind me of my dad, <laughs> like these quite like stoic, northern farmers you know <laughs> and um i'm like oh but then i'd still have to be a farmer and i don't really like farming i guess it's also something about diversity in all senses of the world um before i lived here i lived in bristol and i lived in birmingham and uh if you know those cities well they are very very diverse Mm. Uh, ethnically, religiously, in every possible manner. So it is a bit, a bit strange if you come to a part of of rural Britain which is predominantly white British. It's sort of like that. So that was a bit odd. And I must admit, before I'd lived here for a few years, and uh, when I got to the point of getting a job and thinking, right, I'd like to buy a house, I had a moment of. Do I stay here or do I do I need to go back to the city? Um, but I love Worksworth and this town so much, and the people are so warm, so welcoming, so friendly. I can't imagine not having. If I hadn't have been here, I probably wouldn't have come out, which is kind of a, a weird, topsy turvy side of things. Yeah. Where most people feel they have to leave a small 
rural location to be themselves. For me, it, it was the other way around. Um, and there's something, there's something about a smaller community where you know everybody that, that if as long as it's um, not a toxic environment or anything like that, can actually be very reassuring. You know, where you know you walk down the street and everybody, I don't, everybody knows your name. And it's not like it's not like Return to the 1950s, but it, it is kind of. If I feel like there is a real community here, whereas the city gives you freedom through anonymity. Nobody mm -hmm. knows you, no one, and no one really cares as long as you don't get in the way of their lives. You can do whatever you want. So there's freedom there, but by being anonymous. It's, a false, it's almost like a false dichotomy of acceptance I find in the city sometimes. You know, I think you can almost like find your tribe maybe more easily in a city based on numbers, maybe. But like, there's accept, I don't know. I think sometimes there's acceptance in the countryside and rural spaces in different ways. I think there's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, I think those prejudices exist in some in some ways exist in a really, in a way that's kind of very precarious, you know. But I also know, like, the way that family, my family or farmers would accept people. They might accept people in, like, a sort of different way. Mm -hmm. And it's this kind of the idea of, like, um, oh, you don't, you don't talk about sex, you don't talk about sexuality, you don't talk about your business too much. They did accept people on the individual, but maybe not the group as much. Mm. So it's, but, but I think when you're accepted, I wonder if it, is it more genuine acceptance? I, I mean, I don't, I don't know, because I'm like, I don't know, I... I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not. I'm not always too sure, too sure, but like, there's a. It's not straightforward, but I don't think it's as linear as necessarily not fitting in and being excluded. Like I know a lot of people will not go to the countryside for, for understandable reasons, but it's. Yeah. I think the other, thing, the other thing I would say about it is I think, given just the sheer numbers of people in a city, millions of people, it's not just that you can create a bubble of acceptance. That bubble can be age limited as well. So you can surround yourself by lots of people of your own age. Whereas obviously in a smaller town or a smaller village, uh, your allies and the people that you're going to be part of your, your social bubble will be across a huge age range simply because of the numbers. So I've got, there are members and friends of the works with LGBT group who are in their early twenties and there are people who are in their late seventies. So there's diversity Maybe not on an ethnic basis, um, uh, but m a diversity through age range where people who are of different generations mix. And that, I'm thinking of two of my friends here, uh, two, two guys who are, I don't know how to say how old they are, they might be offended, uh, I think in their late 60s, early 70s, I'm being very generous now. Um, but they tell me stories of what life was like for them growing up in the 50s and the 60s, which would make your jaws drop uh, about the conditions that they grew up in, which, you know, you hear about that maybe in documentaries or on film. But it's quite another to hear it directly from somebody who's had that as their lived experience. So I guess off the back of what you've just discussed, I would ask if there's any specific challenges that you think young LGBTQI plus people face in rural settings and rural, in rural communities? So one of the things I, uh, a friend of mine locally said, um, just in passing, was how many people in the, the town where I live, and in, not, it's not just this town, it's other towns now, didn't come out until after they left school, that somehow if, you're, if you were questioning your sexuality or your gender identity, or if you were identifying as queer or non-binary or whatever you were identifying with, that is something that you can't do before you've left school. And I found that a little bit sad. Um, and I guess the reason why people kind of keep a lid on their identity until that point is for fear of being bullied at school. But when I thought about that, I thought, well, that, that could happen in a rural location. It could happen in a city because uh, schools can be quite a brutal and forgiving place for people who are different, um, for want of a better word. But I don't know, is that, is that a silly idea for me to have? I think it's valid. I think it's completely valid. Emma, it, do you think film and TV played a role in the preconceptions you've had of LGBTQ uh, personalities because of growing up in... Um, in a rural setting? 
I think so. I think um, I had a huge like idea that you had to be born this way and like only certain people who knew from a certain age that they were LGBTQI plus um, that like you had to know from like when you were a kid and that I didn't know that I was from a kid so like I came out when I was 19 I didn't even realize that I could be gay <laughs> um, like I didn't know that you could get young people that I thought were cute that were my age or like sort of around my age and um, for like ages I just was like okay this is obviously just what it is like you have crushes on girls and then you just date a boy and that's just what it is. Do you, do you think that your um, watching um, LGBTQI plus um, mo movies and films and TV shows, mm. do you think that fed into what you thought about um, the LGBTQ plus community as a whole because you weren't, weren't exactly the best place to experience it, it as a community? I mean, that's an, that's an assumption, I don't know. Because, I grew up in big old Birmingham, which is, no. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, the first time that I sort of, well, I don't even know, like, I don't think I, I don't think I saw any films or um, movies that had LGBT characters on, like, when I was younger, or if I did, they were definitely, like, like, predatory butch lesbian stereotypes, and, like, um, for a long time, I was really, like, um sort of like I didn't want to be I didn't want to be seen as like a predatory lesbian and like um and also like you the sort of idea that you have to look a certain way and like be a sort of so, certain sort of certain type of person to be queer or to be a lesbian and like for me it turns out that I like having short hair and I also like wearing dresses and like that's something that like a lot of movies and stuff don't really like have those two intersections of like identity it's either like very strict stereotypes which do exist and like not stereotypes but like people dress a certain way and I, like that's completely cool but like I didn't know for ages that that's what I could do as well and um like I think I think for me the lack the complete lack of having any kind of like stuff to watch with like relatable characters in was like it was definitely the first of all it was the most thing that motivated me to sort of like record my own experience because I was like I don't see this anywhere else <laughs> like I need to sort of like start making it myself um and also it kind of it fed into the idea that you had to be in a city you had to like go to London and like obviously because I sort of was interested in art as well like the idea that you have to be in London to do art like those two things were very like connected and um, I thought that if I went to London and did art in London and was gay in London that I could like be myself and it turns out that that doesn't always work and um, like I shaved my hair when I was in London and like that was like six or seven years ago and like um, I probably wouldn't grow it back but like um, like I think London like you said Rupert gave me sort of like the anonymity to like be myself without like the um, the sort of being seen by everybody because like when you live in like a like I don't live in a super rural uh town like the super rural village like I live in quite a big village on the outskirts of a, like a main town and um it still feels like everybody is watching you and like it's kind of nice because like since going back from Manchester I've actually made friends like in a really weird way by just walking my dog up up the road that like I've literally made friends with like all the old people on the road and like they're all like I don't know they're, they love my dog but they also like are really friendly and like I just love talking to everybody and it's really nice because it's like it, I had this like perception that like people here were like really judgy and like people I think can be judgy sometimes but like not everybody and um, I think that has been like a really wholesome thing for me to like like make friends with all the old people because especially because like there is quite a lot of old people here and like I imagine I'm probably one of like like maybe the only queer people that they know or like that they are aware of that, that they know and like, whether they know I'm queer or not as I don't know they might just think I've just got shit, short hair but you never know but like <laughs> you never know. Um, I think you said, I think you said you something really important about how where you felt growing up you didn't feel represented on screen. Yeah. And yeah. there's a weird sort of Thing that's going on there where 
if you don't see yourself on screen, do you even exist? Uh, do you exist just as a thing inside your head and there's no one else in the world that's like you? Whereas as, soon as, you, as soon as you are, as soon as you do see yourself on, on screen, that somehow validates you, not as a person, but the life you want to leave and the person you are. But why do we feel that we have to be on screen to, to feel validated? Why doesn't that validation yeah. come from within? Yeah, I could, like, I, it just seems to be very important. I'd just like to see it in a slightly different way. I think like, um, like screen and not screen, it's like, I think every community tells stories like looks at stories and has kind of or has always like told stories and i think if you're like um from like a rural space or a space where there's maybe less diverse where there either is less diversity or is perceived as less diverse there's always like a set of rules that you're kind of meant to live by so growing up in those ways you kind of hold on to, for me like you might hold on to those rules and the people around you hold on to those rules so it's almost like whilst this is why why do I feel the need to be like this? Who's saying it? No one might explicitly say it, but there's, there's those like codes are governed by that community. So I feel for me it's like in the absence of I, I still remember the first time I saw like a gay farmer. It was in an episode of Hollyoaks, and he was a farmer's son, and he was gay, and I, I still remember it, you know. But like in the absence of that, I probably looked at like. Um, I was kind of almost like obsessed by the idea of like what's racism look like in rural spaces. Or there's like a photographer called um, Ingrid Pollard. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Ingrid Pollard. But so Ingrid Pollard, she did a series of like um, photo, photos of her as like um, a, black, a, black, a black woman in, in the countryside called Pastoral Interlude. So I was just kind of, I, I probably looked towards, maybe a voyeuristic thing, but I looked at these like communities that I found looking quite traditional or these quite patriarchal communities. Um, like for like how they were in the countryside what that was like kind of for them because i couldn't see anything in it so for me it was a bit like i think there's probably something about what you say michelle like, that i didn't need to hold on to these stories to find validation but i probably think that i did find that you know and it made quite a difference just to know that i could exist i think you know i, I think that's a great segue to start looking at the story that you actually helped create rupert um so do you want to introduce landline um yeah um Landline is a short film about a gay farmer's helpline. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think. I always just had this idea of wanting to make a documentary about kind of gay farmers. Could I just, the few farmers that I met who were gay over the years, I was just, again, intrigued about how they, I remember, I remember, I remember the first person I met, he was a guy who was, he had his own, like stables like outside of London. He came to this group, and I was just like sort of fascinated. Like, how did you? How did you stay? Why do you say? Why did you not leave? You should have left. <laughs> just like um, <laughs> the intrigue about his life, you know. Um, like I didn't know it was an option almost. And then I just met a few, and I heard about this, this helpline that set up for gay farmers. And I was um, working at the time on a London lesbian gay switch borders just as a volunteer. So I was just kind of probably came at it. So I just got in touch with this guy, Keith, and he said, he spoke to one of two, Keith Innocent, who's the, the chaplain who set up the helpline, um, a gay man himself. Um, and I just became really interested in the story. And um, yeah, I began to talk about it with my friend, um, Matt Houghton, who's the film director. And so, yeah, we kind of ended up interviewing a lot of these farmers. And it, originally we were just um, speaking to a lot of gay farmers and most of them had spoken to Keith in some capacity. So we ended up deciding to focus on this, the helpline and the, the um, people that Keith spoke to. There's a few different, um, there's like I think maybe four or five different callers who feature in the um, film. But I decided to go with Emily because I thought that was maybe a bit more of a nuanced story. You know, some were more uplifting, some less so, some talk about suicide, but his what I thought was more a bit more nuanced, you know. So that's why I decided to, to feature Emily's clip. Um, yeah, so Emily was one of those people that we spoke to who kind of, I don't know, sort of found this way to navigate and navigate his sexuality, you know. So it's, um, so, it's uh, so that's why I thought this clip was maybe more representative than some of the other others, you know. If that okay. answers your questions, all right? It, it does, yeah. And we're going to play um, Landline now for everyone. Hi, 
I grew up in a small rural village in West Wales. There are hidden rules and regulations. You know, this kind of behaviour is tolerated and this kind of behaviour isn't. There's no such thing as a gay farmer, but I feel as if there's something in me, there's that vein of rural life which will never disappear. Sound really weird, but I was doing Tai Chi for a long number of years. My doctor at home get up to live with sciatica for the rest of my life, and I thought, bugger you, I'm not going to. I met this gentleman who was also going to the Tai Chi. We'd see each other, we used to smile and, you know, and he used to stay way after the time and... and I used to have to remind him sometimes, oh, you better go home to your wife and kids now. I still remember him now, and to be perfectly honest with you, I have thought about him often. You do remember your first love. So, Rupert, you've already discussed the genesis of your project. Um, Emma, do you want to talk to us about how your project began? So, um, I moved back from Manchester to where I live now, which is with my parents, actually. Um, and um, I sort of was looking at the way that I could come, come home to myself, um, sort of in a rural space and what that meant because I had no sort of form of validation in that way that like my queer friends were in Manchester still like my partner lived in South Wales at the time and like it was kind of weird because I was like sort of in this space where I had all this like this history and like how can I in a way like work out where my space was in that space um and like I kind of embraced the idea that I was like a rural outsider and kind of like instead of trying to find immediately trying to find myself within the community I actually tried to find myself within the land and what that meant to me like within the within like nature within um like the soil and like from the soil grow back up again into like part of the community as like as someone who felt more rooted rather than someone who just sort of like blew in like a leaf <laughs> You did that through rural media. Can you tell us a little bit about that um, that relationship between you and rural media, and what is rural media for those of our viewers that don't know? So, um, rural media is a production company, and also I think they're part charity, based in Hereford. And um, I applied for like the job of rural artist because, like, not rural artist, digital artist. As I saw this job for like digital artist, I was like, that's a job title. Um, and um, and I applied, and like, they didn't say I didn't, I wasn't able to get the job because I didn't have enough experience, but they were like, we really love, really loved you during the interview. Do you want to have like a junior version of that, like, um, of that job? And they were also like, we really liked what you were saying about sort of being queer in the countryside because like I, I kind of didn't want to come home and go back in the closet I didn't want to be pretend to not be who I was because all my art that I've made whilst I was in Manchester was about being queer and like my experience of that and I was like I'm not going to go back into the closet I'm not going to pretend that that didn't happen um I want to talk openly about being queer in the countryside and they were like we want you to make queer work and I was like what does this mean <laughs> Um, like I didn't expect that to happen um, and I was really really surprised but then like it actually they they really support young artists um, young filmmakers like, well not even just filmmakers young people in general and they want to sort of like get young people's voices out they also like really um, support the traveling community which I think is really like it shows that it's not just like a superficial like 
we want just want to support like this one queer filmmaker like they're really like through what they do it really shows that they want to su support voices that aren't heard very often and I thought that was really like cool that that existed in like a rural county um and like I was really having quite a difficult time with like I had really severe knee pain and like I couldn't come in very often um into because it, it was like a three-hour journey for me to get from door to door um and it was um I was sort of having sort of a bit of a, a weird mental health time as well like things were quite like because it was winter it was quite slow um and like it was quite challenging but in like a way that they really really supported me and like I really was like so grateful of that experience because like it was such a nurturing way to come back to the countryside and like especially being encouraged to make queer artwork queer video like that wasn't something that I'd ever expected and like it was really really lovely and that's the thing I mean like none of you come from a film background what was it about film that really drew you in <laughs> for me in general well for me personally um it was about not seeing myself and I was like when I was at uni I did my dissertation it wasn't a dissertation it was a critical analysis but like my third year essay I did it about um personal experience in academic writing and whilst doing all the research for that like there was there was like barely any information and like barely like there was quite a lot of people quite a lot there was like a couple of people in the 90s who were like doing a lot of research into like um space and sexuality and um there was actually a a, a geographer i think he's a geographer john binney at manchester met who was um who does still do quite a lot and um it was really interesting because like I was like looking at this one person's piece of writing who was in Sweden and it was their like their master's thesis I think it was and um they they spoke about their experience in a queer area and because I didn't see myself I was like why am I not making what I want to see and like um and with obviously like social media and like being able to sh to share your like experience like really really quickly and really easily like if you've made like a network of people um and also if you haven't got a network of people like sharing your experience online can like draw people in or like even connect with people that you didn't know would be interested in that and like sharing your experience and then sort of i don't know like i've had people come back to me and be like i knew i knew you when we were at school and like actually seeing you do this has been like really interesting because it's made me think about myself and um and I think through video you share well for me anyway I share exactly what I've seen and like I think to share my viewpoint is like a really valuable thing because like my viewpoint hasn't been shared in like obviously not just my viewpoint but like people like me our viewpoints haven't been shared that often or heard or seen and I think that's really important to like even though obviously everybody's experiences are important, but like to see viewpoints and like experiences that aren't often heard. Michelle, what do you think about um, Emma's perspective on, on um, their experience and drawing from film? What, what drew you to film in, in comparison, sorry? Yeah, uh, I kind of feel like a bit of an interloper surrounded by all these creative artistic types. <laughs> because um, I, I don't create anything. I'm not a filmmaker like some of these wonderful people. But um, I guess what, what happened is uh, the story is, is that I am a huge fan of the Archers. And um, there's a group called the Academic Archers, believe it or not, a bunch of academics get together to discuss the archers uh, and its significance to humanity. And last year, or maybe the year before, one of the sessions was about being queer in the archers, being queer in a rural context. And it really started making me think about where I was, where I was physically, you know. So it kind of, that, that session inspired me to come back and, and do two things. One was to <clears throat> do this carnival float. And then off the back of that, I realised I didn't want that event to be just once a year. Uh, and a group of people had sort of kind of coalesced around doing that. So uh, in the town where I live in Worksworth, Gemma the Peak, uh, 
Uh, there's a wonderful kind of uh, boutique, uh, um, some people might say arts based uh, cinema, but it, it shows blockbusters just as well. And I noticed some of the other local groups, mainly the Twinning Society, had started to run films there, mainly as fundraisers to fund the, the Twinning Society. So I picked up on that and thought, well, why don't we do that? Um, so for me, it was as much about putting on a season of films that would represent a narrative across the whole community, uh, whatever you identify as, but also about bringing people together physically. Because at that stage, we had a Facebook group and we'd done the carnival, but I didn't want it to be just like an online thing. Uh, I wanted to try and bring people together, often from very different backgrounds, different classes, different ages and things like that. And so the cinema idea seemed a great way of bringing people together so they could actually meet and make real in-person connections with each other, but also have an entertaining evening out. And the other thing I was thinking of at the time was, you know, when you meet a bunch of 50 people you don't know, what are you going to talk about? Um, so I thought, in a way, the film would be a focal point, uh, especially when the film had come to an end, because I guess it's a bit like going on a date. You can talk about the film. What did you think of the characters? What did you think of the story? Was that unrealistic, realistic? Does it matter if it's realistic or not? And so I definitely didn't want a situation where when the film was over, people just went by. So the great thing about Northern Lights is it does have like its own little bar area and social area which I sort of dressed up in rainbow flags and the whole whole lot. So it, it became like a whole evening of which the, the film was the, the focal point. Um, of course, you can't ignore the fact that we're in this middle of this COVID thing. So sadly, a lot of that, a lot of that work has just come to a halt because the cinema had to close its doors. At the moment, the cinema is doing a couple of outdoor events while the weather is, is okay. So they showed uh, A Life of Brian last week. This week they're showing Moulin Rouge in an outdoor setting with social distancing in place. And my hope is that with a little bit of funding, I think from the BFI, it might have been some from other source, the, the cinema will have enough financial resources to reignite the, 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 the season of films and be able to offset the fact that, you know, they can't fill all the seats because of social distancing and still be economically viable. But that's, that's how it sort of got started. That's really interesting. Um, we'll move more on to about watching the film in a royal setting in a bit. But Emma, do you want to introduce Rewilding for us? Um, so this is my film, Rewilding. It's a uh, vid video installation um, exploring queerness, identity, rurality, and digital connection. Um, it draws our attention to the overlooked experiences of the familiar surroundings magic contained in our everyday lives and the nature we're a part of. If a queer falls in the woods and there is no one there to see them, did they even exist at all? If I live a queer life in the countryside and no one acknowledges me, did I even live at all? To be seen is to be acknowledged. To be acknowledged is to be recognised. To be recognised is to be seen to be seen as to be human. The need to be seen has required me to search out of this realm, into another dimension, into digital space. The need to be seen is not out of vanity, it is the need for validation. To have someone else confirm to me that I have lived and that I am real, it is vital. After all, even so, through the edge of the trees, I see myself. I am seen. I am real. As are you. Can I ask how both your films, Emma and Rupert, how were they were received? I think it was kind of um, kind of received quite well, but I still felt like it was an audience that will go see short films. Hmm. Uh, in the city you know and so yeah yeah i think it was received well but i also like i kind of really wanted it to be in a rural space like to be right. shown in a rural space to be sh to be shown by a 
in the rural community. Like my dream was for it to be shown at like young farmers groups, like all like people who are from the communities that it was made by. Like so, I think like so it's, it's like so Michelle's event that she's running that that is like perfect. But also a lot of a lot of farmers don't go to the cinema. You know, like like someone made a really good comment that um, farmers will go to the cinema, and this is quite um, gendered and an assum assum assumption of who is a farmer in itself. Farmers will go to the cinemas when their wives drag them to the cinemas. So it was kind of well received, and we got some press in like the Farmers Weekly, which is like the magazine that I, my dad grew up reading. So I was really pleased that it got into those spaces. But I felt like it was received. I feel it might have been received by more of an urban film going audience, and I mm. wanted to be in a different space. Uh, Emma, do you feel similarly? Um, my film hasn't really been hasn't really gone anywhere. So I finished it just. It was supposed to be showcased just the week that we went into lockdown so like um it hasn't actually been showcased in that way um i've sent it to quite a few people that like i feel might have resonated with it and like from them i've like because obviously like the last line um is, is about seeing yourself and i think that like that is for the people that that need to have that said to them but it's about you seeing yourself and regardless of who goes to see that like I think whoever sees it as well like even if it's like online if it's like someone's phone whatever like they might not think anything of it but they also might just reflect on like how they treat other people in the world or how they treat themselves yeah. or like what it might mean to be that person who feels very alone and feels very like like they're the only person that exists and then or to people that are, are queer in the countryside to see yourself as an act of like acknowledging that you exist and to acknowledge that you're real and that you're a person like that can literally save your life mm -hmm. and like even if it means for me to say I see you like um like I want to be that that sort of like start of someone seeing themselves because like it's all well and good other people seeing you but like if you don't see yourself like like that's the real the real stuff there Michelle, what are the main things you take into consideration when programming for a rural audience? One of the first things that I was very keen to do was for every letter of the rainbow, there should be a film that, that resonates. Um, so we, I have put into the programme uh, a film about a relationship between two young men in France. It was a French film, forget the title. Uh, and then we, we showed Rafiki, which is the story of two young women uh, in, set in Africa. I forget which country it was now. And then the third film was a film that um, uh, Pedro Amavar sponsored, um, A Fantastic Woman, um, which is, came out a few years ago. So for me, it's important when we come to put films on that I'm, you know, making sure that everybody feels that there will be a film where they feel represented, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, weirdly, it's been a lot of foreign language films that we've done, which wasn't particularly planned. Um, but I mean, one of the things I'm thinking just about the conversation we're having today is I need your films on. Uh, we've got to show your films along, alongside our main feature, whatever that might be. Um, there is a place, as was being said a moment ago, a, a film about a rural location, presented in a rural location. I mean, we're not in deepest, darkest uh, peak district here. It's, not, it's a small market town, so I don't want to overstate how rural we are. Um, but... I think what's nice about having a kind of community cinema or a cinema that is very local to you is if you think back to when my parents were growing up, there used to be three or four or five, six cinemas in a single town, uh, you know, before television really took off. Uh, and there was actually a, a cinema in this town back in the day, but it closed in, I don't know when, the 70s or 80s. And it was um, Paul and Esther Carr, who were two uh, local people here, who built Northern Light Cinema from scratch, from an, uh, what used to be an old hardware shop with a warehouse at the back. That warehouse became the cinema. And without them, there wouldn't have been the space for me to put these films on. 
So, mm. you know, it's about, I think you have to sort of create the venue. So um, there is another cinema not far away from here um, in a town called Belper. And there's another settlement near where I live called Middleton. And they have a community uh, cinema that runs, I think, once every two weeks or once a month before COVID hit. So I think in a way, if we want more films about rural locations being made and more films about rural locations being played in rural locations, you've got to have the venues to do that. So without the cinema here, people would have to venture to the outskirts of Chesterfield or Derbyshire or even into Nottingham uh, to where Broadway uh, uh, cinema is. Mm. So it's about accessibility as much as, yeah. you know, uh, there's no point in putting in a season of films if people have to drive an hour and often to get to see the film. Don't yeah, I, I completely agree. So um, just one more question. What piece of advice would you give to potential filmmakers living rurally in one sentence? I'd say <laughs> don't be afraid to share your experience. I would say try to try to step outside your experience to know what it is that makes sure your experience can connect with other people at the same time as telling it in an authentic way. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, Mich Michelle, as a programmer, um, what, what advice would you give to filmmakers, young filmmakers living rurally? Wow, God, my advice. I don't know. Um, it's really hard to, to answer that and feel I can authentically give somebody advice about what films they should make when I've never made one myself. But um, I guess one thing that came out of um, the thoughts that I always have is about Whatever the narrative is, it's got to come naturally out of the experience rather than it being sort of shoehorned into a situation. I find it really difficult to describe what I mean by that. Yeah, um, I think like authentic storytelling. Yeah, um, I, I guess it comes from me talking about the uh, Archers thing. There's always this tension in, I think, in some forms that... Um, do you merely reflect reality as you see it? Or do you create a film which is a vision of what you would like the world to be? Um, and there are some people who want a kind of simulacrum of reality that, you know, it can't be in an imagination of what the world could be like. Um, so I guess there must be space for both a kind of like, the world as which I see it and the world as which I'd like it to be. And, and I guess anybody who can manage to bring those two things together have got the license to print money. Um, <laughs> but I, if I knew how that was done, I'd be doing it, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for answering that question. That's all we have time for today. Um, thank you for a huge thank you to all our guests. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for talking so openly about your own experiences. That was actually really enlightening for me as someone's always been in a city environment to, to understand queerness outside of the city. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for watching this event. Please look out for more events curated by BFI Film Academy Young Programmers during the BFI London Film Festival.